podcast again. Um, earlier we had Varun who was talking about his experience with Yang and now we have Naomi. She is from uh, from the state of Florida. Um, so I'll just um, I'll have her give her introduction as to uh, where she's from, what she's doing, how she found out about Yang. So Naomi, over to you, if you can just give a quick intro about yourself. Hi, how you doing? Um, like Ryan said, my name is Naomi and I'm from the state of Florida, originally from Connecticut. And I came across Andrew Yang um, from an article that was posted on Facebook um, on a friend of mine's that I saw on my timeline or newsfeed actually. So it was um, mostly centered around his universal basic income and uh, had kind of like an introduction of who he is and why he believes that we need a UBI. Mm -hmm. So um, I read the article and a lot of things started making sense. And this is going to sound cliche, but everybody notices the automation going around, going on in the stores on a retail level and, um, you know, on a even at the manufacturing plants. So if you think mm -hmm. about a lot of people, like how many people got laid off from manufacturing, it all clicked. So I read into him more and I try to search up UBI and search out. Um, his policies and everything like that, fact checking, Googling, and everything absolutely made sense. So, um, you know, that's something that really interested me. And then after a while, I mean, I think this was like two years ago. So then, okay. of course, about maybe nine months ago is when uh, the campaigns and everything, you saw the videos on YouTube, and then I heard about Nerd for Yangs mm -hmm. and um, Nerds for Yang. And I, you know, went from there and fell down the YouTube rabbit hole and just watched videos nonstop. So, you mm -hmm. know, that's how I came to uh, Yang Gang. Wow. Great, great. So, so do you think that Andrew Yang is your, I mean, is, is he just like an above average candidate or is he kind of unique and like you're not sure you we, we might see him again well the thing about yang and i'm sure that a lot of people would agree is that he is very unique and uh i i read the comment sections a lot in youtube and on social media in general and um everybody kind of like there's there's mixed reviews about him like a lot of people and you know they they think his ideas are bold some people think mm -hmm. his ideas are brand new. A lot of people are like, yeah, he's going to take us, you know, to the next level. So, um, he, you know, he he basically he he attracts and has a lot of appeal on all sides, you know, mm -hmm. whether you're Republican, Democrat, um, undecided, you know, whether, whether you're any political party, you know, even libertarian, you know, mm -hmm. uh, he he attracts all those type of people. and. Um, you know, it, it's a pretty crazy mixture, but, you know, that just shows you his appeal. So a lot of people, some people even say he's like a once in a lifetime candidate. And I believe that. So, you know, that's yeah. a big reason why I support him. I believe that too. Um, so as I was saying also in the, in the previous um, podcast uh, with Varun is that Yang is a person that I have not seen anywhere in my lifetime, um, I mean, let's just forget about American politics right now. It's just let's just focus on world politics for a moment. And I haven't seen a guy the way that he talks about policies and ideas. Oh, and you know, like he says all the time, he's not a politician or he's barely a politician. Barely so. a politician. Yes. <laughs> I that's, mean, that's like literally one of his quotes i'm barely a politician it's i'm it's barely true, a though. politician that's he's just wearing that is, the suit right now exactly no and, i mean now he's of course a politician because he's running but yes he's barely a politician uh in in so many senses and and i think for me also what really drew yang and i think for a lot of people is his focus on family and like I mean, I know there are lots of um, 
mothers out there who are struggling, you know, like stay at home moms, stay at home dads, even. And, uh, you know, people who are struggling with mental health, uh, which we'll kind of touch base upon. And I, I mean, even if other candidates talk about it, the way that Yang talks about it is so different. Like it's actually coming in from his heart. And I think that is um, that's just amazing. What do you think? One of the things that draws me to him is that he's relatable. Yes. Be relatable to everybody. He's relatable to me. Because he, he's always bringing out to the forefront about his family. And like you yeah. say, he's a family guy and he loves his family. Yes. Um, his son, he's got a son that's on the autism spectrum. Yes. And so do I, you know. And you might hear my voice kind of crack up a, lot, a, a little bit, but, you know, it's personal. So I know that I can relate to him and he can relate to people like me who right. have that struggle. Right. Because, you know, it's not the end of the world. You know, kids, they get better. You know, um, one of the biggest things is the fact that a lot of kids on the autism spectrum are nonverbal. Mm -hmm. And my kid is one of them. I've got right. two of them. And they're right. under the age of 10. So I know that he can relate to people like me. And if yeah. you look at the statistics, because, you know, he's a data-driven guy. If you look at the statistics... You're going to you, you, you tend to kind of recognize that a lot of families are being affected in that way, too. And it's not just right. autism. It's other disabilities or, you know, um, he, like he says, atypical is the new normal. Absolutely. And it's yeah. because it spreads so wide. Yes. Like I, I could tell you about the experience from when I first started realizing. Mm -hmm. So I saw a lot of characteristics that my son had that, you know, I didn't see in other kids his age. And he mm -hmm. was barely a top. I right. was working um, as a retail, you know, cashier at a store. And a customer came in, a guy, and he had his son with him. Now, mm -hmm. I heard his son doing, like, howling sounds. And, you know, and I, I noticed that because it, it ticked because of my son. So the kid, the boy seemed very like irritable, not comfortable at all, mm -hmm. you know, and he was just, he was having a meltdown. He was having a hard time. Mm -hmm. So when the guy came to my register and went to pay for his things, he seemed very frustrated too, mm -hmm. but you know, he was very patient with him. Mm -hmm. And, uh, when they got to my counter, I noticed his son looked very like he wasn't in a good mood. Mm -hmm. So I you know, I kind of try to figure out, like, how am I going to approach this guy? Because I have concerns about my son, too. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't know, I didn't want to offend him. Mm -hmm. But I did ask him, like, is your son okay? You know, stuff like that. Just to show right. that, you know, I know his son is in distress just because I care. Right. So he was like, yeah, he's, he's fine. He's just, he's, this is how he is. And I said, uh, I'm sorry. And he was like, yeah, my son is on autism spectrum. Mm -hmm. So then it clicked because I already had my suspicions from other things that I saw and noticed myself. Mm -hmm. And I had asked him for resources. Like, does he know anybody? Because this was before my son was even diagnosed. I see. So he gave me a piece of, well, I gave him a piece of paper and a pen and he wrote down his wife's phone number mm -hmm. and he asked me, I'll contact my wife. She might be able to help you out, you know, navigate it. Because it's not easy. Especially mm -hmm. when your kid is any diagnosed. Right. So from there, that's where I started looking into specialists, early intervention programs, stuff like that. Mm. And from there, he got diagnosed right before he was age three. You know, mm. so doing okay with his verbal skills. But like I said, it's not the end. You know, you just got to work at it and try to maintain positivity and don't look at your kids any different. And you that yeah. really struck me with Andrew Yang when he talks about his son. Yeah, that's, that's so touching. I mean, um, to just know that it impacts you so deeply and so personally, uh, I think, uh, you know, it's, he's actually talking about the issues that affect us in real yeah. life and you know in everyday life and i mean he's uh, i mean 
I guess it's because he's just being human. And whereas if you look at any other candidates, I mean, yeah, they are human, but are they presenting themselves as, as human? Or are they trying to be relatable? And like you said, you know, Andrew Yang is such a relatable person. Um, one of the things that he brings up a lot in his speeches, as well as um, also on the stage, is the issue about mental health. And, um, I mean, gosh, I, I, I think world over, um, people are struggling with mental issues. Uh, do you think that's like a paramount issue right now and that we, we really need to focus on that? It is an issue that everybody talks about in society. Like, because, yeah. you know, social media, this is another thing that Yang touches on. Social media does cause people to be more antisocial. You're actually and right about that. Yeah. And I could remember years ago, I was looking at a um, news article, like when social media started blowing up. I saw a news article that said that social media is make is it making society antisocial? I was like, no, it's not. Everybody's communicating. You know, mm -hmm. you're being you're you're meeting people you never would ever meet in real life. You're mm -hmm. reconnecting with family members. You're reconnecting with people you went to school with. You know, mm -hmm. and and I'm like, hey, there's no way it's not making people antisocial. We're talking. Mm -hmm. So, but then it's like, you start to realize now you start to see everybody on their smartphones, on their iPhones, whatever. And I'm guilty of this too. I think we all are. All Where are, social yeah. media takes up so much of our life and it's, it does become sort of an addiction. And that's another thing that Andrew Yang touches on a lot with social media. He talks mm -hmm. about how it causes depression. It causes antisocial behavior, stuff like that. But at the same time, social media has also been good because people can go, you know, go into groups for support, whether right. you're a parent, whether you're someone struggling with past traumas, whether you're a veteran and you have right. PTSD, it connects right. people all around the world. Right. Look how amazing it is that we can have this conversation right now and we're not even in the same country. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? So, mm -hmm. yeah, technology has a lot of good, but it also has its cons, you know, its pros and cons. Right. So mental health does have a lot to do with it. It can technology, social media can either make or break you. But, you know, mm -hmm. the, the one thing for sure is that depression, antisocial behavior, um, anything like that, it can be elevated. Mm -hmm. And. Um, I don't think that people realize what he's talking about when he spe when he speaks. So mm -hmm. yeah, um, mental health is definitely an issue. It's a real mm -hmm. big problem now. It's it seems that it's a bigger problem now than it's ever been, but that's only because of technology and how everybody everything connects. Yeah. So um, it's like, what do you do? Everybody talks about it. Somebody commits a shooting, and everybody's like. Oh, you know, he was mentally ill on drugs mm -hmm. or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, and nobody else, like, look at the gun situation, like right. gun safety laws and all that. That's a really hot button topic with politics. Mm -hmm. Yes. Every, like, you got some candidates that are like, we're going to take your guns, we're going to confiscate them, it's going to be a mandatory buyback, whatever they say. And people mm -hmm. are alarmed by that, especially people on the right. They don't mm. like that. They don't want yeah. people coming and taking their guns. Right. So, yes, yeah, sometimes on the topic, Andrew Yang has to kind of try to appeal, try to, you know, appeal to everybody, both sides. So there is no right answer with that. But if you look at what he's talking about, connecting mental health to the way people, you know, do self-destructive behavior. Yeah. You know, and then they do things they can't take back. You can't take back suicide. Exactly. Yeah. You can't take back murder. Right. Okay. Sometimes it doesn't end in death and some people mm -hmm. get hurt and it affects them in their life. You know, like somebody yeah. could get the snot beat out of them and end up, up like bedridden for the rest of their life, paralyzed, yeah. whatever. Very true. Yes. Some people go through issues at work. People mm -hmm. that do hard labor, they mm -hmm. put their bodies through so much stress. Mm hmm. 
they can go through an injury. They can lose their employment from just a simple injury, sciatic issues yeah. on their back right. or whatever. And right. when they can't get to work because they're bedridden, they're hurting, mm -hmm. they're on disability. It is true that a job does give people meaning. It does make them feel good that they've accomplished a good work day and they're getting paid and everything. Everything's fine. Mm -hmm. But now the downside to that, like they've right. said, wages have been so stagnant. People are people are out of work and mm -hmm. they're miserable. They're they're mad because they feel like their life has no value unless they're working. And I yes. saw yeah. a I saw a quote on Facebook that said um, mm -hmm. something to the effect that employment, something people ask you what you do for a living to measure up the amount of respect that they should treat you with. Mm -hmm. And that shouldn't be the case. And that's what Andrew talks about when he talks about human centered capitalism. Yep. You know, and yeah, uh, it feels good to have a job and feel like you accomplished something through your day. Yeah. But at the same time, all of the money you get from working, backbreaking work sometimes, you're spending it on bills. Everything's so expensive. Everything is so high. You know, so, so now you're depressed because you can't take your family out on a nice dinner out. You can't go on a date night with your spouse because you got to worry yeah. about paying your bills first. Right. Um, you can't get your kids their brand new jerseys for their sports or sign them up for karate or anything like that because it costs money. Right. So now you're still stuck in that spot. And like he says, people are working paycheck to paycheck. And what are what do people have to show for? That their bills are paid? Great. They have a roof over their head. That's awesome. There's mm -hmm. food in the pantry. You, you know, your kids are fed. But if you can't enjoy your family and you can't enjoy your life, and you're working, you're living to work, to pay bills, and die? Mm -hmm. What is that? Of course, people are going to be miserable. People are going to be pissed. Yeah. I'm sorry, but people are going to be mad. Yeah. So that goes ahead with, if you're not mad, some people are depressed and sunken mm -hmm. in. And people who are on disability, who have a hard time going to work, but they push their bodies to it, they come home and they're miserable. Right. Because they're in so much pain, because they're so tired and have mm -hmm. nothing to show for. You know, I live yeah. in Florida and I would like to take my kids out to Disney. That would be I would amazing. Like to yeah. Take them out to Universal Studios, at least get a little season pass that I could pay, you know, $20 a month for each ticket just to get kind of like a payment plan to at least take them out once in a while. Yes. Even something yeah. simple like taking them to a, a a jump park or something like a trampoline park, anything, or just yes. as simple as taking them to like fine eating, movies, right. whatever. Right. And we're so confined in our houses. If we're not home, we're working, we're busting our backs, and coming yeah. home and too tired to even you know enjoy our kids. Couples yeah. are not eating dinner together no more at the dinner table. Because yeah. there's always a, uh, either the wife is away at work and going to be late or right. the husband works an overnight job and has to sleep most of the day to get their energy back to go back to work and then come home and sleep. People are, you know, it, it's just you shouldn't have mm. to do that just to survive. Wow. It should, it's fine if you want to do that, you know, mm -hmm. so you can you want to work extra hours so that you have extra money for Christmas or to take your family out. That's mm -hmm. good, mm -hmm. but you shouldn't have to bust your back and not be able to do those things because you got to spend it yeah. all on necessities, basic needs. So a thousand dollars a month would definitely help boost people up, not just financially, but mentally too. Mentally, yes, yes, yes. You know, I mean, so you, you've touched on so many different areas, and it's it's. Yeah, I mean, mental health is, it's, is a crazy yeah, thing. It all connects. People talk about Andrew Yang like he's a one-trick pony. That's what they call him. Mm -hmm. He's a French <laughs> candidate. He's got no policy. Which, the dude yeah. has over 160 policies. Is it that much? <laughs> On top that's, of universal that's, that's basic income. On top of universal basic income. Yeah. So think about what that does for somebody who is able to survive and provide for their families 
it does boost up their confidence a lot more. And the other thing that I think about is when I mentioned PTSD, as far as like the veterans, Mm -hmm. um, why are there veterans in homeless shelters? There shouldn't be. Yeah. Why? They serve this country, right? Mm -hmm. People talk about the veterans every single political um, cycle. People talk about what they're going to do for the veterans. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, but I don't think that this country is doing enough for them if they're still living in homeless shelters and right. out peddling on the streets. Right. Okay. They're out here, you know, in wheelchairs begging for money. Right. Uh, the holding up signs. I see that all the time out here in Florida every day. Oh, I could sad. go any given time of the day to certain areas in Florida and there's homeless people spread everywhere. That is sad. Yes. And a lot of them are like this. There's some people that have prosthetic legs and they're in wheelchairs begging mm-hmm. for change outside of Walmart. It mm-hmm. happened. Why are they out there? Why are they strung out? Some of them are strung out in drugs. Why are yeah. they strung out? It's because they're going through the mental um, things that they had to see while they were away at war. Mm-hmm. You know, it, stuff happens. A spouse dies, a loved one dies, something happens, and, and your whole world falls apart. And you feel like you have no support. Yes. Veterans should be able to have the support because I'm sure a lot of them have seen things and experienced things, even at war times. They've yes. seen and experienced things that is traumatic to them. It burns in their head. Yes. I know someone personally who on like 4th of July and stuff, he can't go out and watch the fireworks because he goes into like, you know, it's like a trigger. And he freaks out. Yes, makes sense. Because of the fireworks and it's loud bomb sounds. Right. Okay. (laughs) Wow. People have these issues. Yeah. And it's and they did this as a sacrifice. They sacrificed their their chance to have their families every day like we do. They sacrifice um, having dinner with their kids. Some of them sacrifice being able to see their kid be born. Exactly. That's that's just crazy. They should not be living in homeless shelters, strung out on drugs. Yep. Or, yep. you know, homeless for whatever reason. Nobody should be. Mm-hmm. Right. So wow. that plays a lot with mental health and like how I mentioned with the gun thing with the gun mm-hmm. situation, Andrew Yang wants to put people mentally in a better place so that they don't feel like they have to go and shoot up a Walmart because they're mad at society. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Okay. They don't have to, uh, Go to events. People shouldn't have to be afraid to go to events. People shouldn't right. be and have, have to be afraid to go to a movie theater and worry about if somebody's going to be in that dark, big, play, a big place and, yes. and shoot up the theater. Like Absolutely. I think the guy was James Holmes a few years yes. ago. Yes, yes. I remember that. Yes. Okay. You got to get to the root of the issue. And if these politicians are not going to take it seriously, there's going to be a lot more blood out there to shed. And it's going to happen whether or not you ban guns. People could buy, yeah. ban- and people could buy guns on the black market right now any, any second of the day if they had access. Yep, that's true. Yep. Okay. You got all these laws, right? Mm-hmm. And most of the ones that are out there causing you know causing death and shooting people got mm-hmm. their guns like on the low they didn't go through the legal process exactly okay so gun laws only keep honest people from going out and doing those things or not complying with the laws it mm-hmm. does not stop people who are already criminals or people who are thinking about suicide or people who are thinking about shooting up a public place it doesn't stop them mm-hmm. Because if they're going to get their hands on a gun, they're going to do it anyway. So true, yeah. So So Andrew Yang wants to get to the bottom of what's causing people to do this. What's your problem? Is it because Mm -hmm. you're not working? Is it because you you lost your house? 
Mm -hmm. you upset because you think the immigrants are taking your jobs? So you're going to go to El Paso, Texas and shoot up a Walmart full of uh, a Walmart where you know there's going to be Hispanics at? Right. You know, why should yeah. anybody feel the need to have to take it there? Exactly. That's what you have to get down to the problem. Wow. You know, and if Yang wants to get to the root of that. He's not out there saying he's going to take your guns or he's going to ban all your guns. He's mm -hmm. not saying he's going to have the police up in your house and confiscate your guns. Mm -hmm. Saying let's try to, you know, make some people feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, the ones who feel like there should be stronger regulations. Let those mm -hmm. people have something to feel comfortable about. Mm -hmm. But if, you know, at the same time, Let's also get to this problem where mental health is what's causing people to lash out and feel like they have to do this. Totally, totally. I I think what you're saying, Naomi, is so authentic and so right. I mean, uh, if Yang, I, I think Yang, like what other people have said, he's He's a once-in-a-lifetime candidate because he's talking about these issues that affect people such as yourself, such as me, and various different peoples from across the divide and different uh, groups and people. And I think it's so important to know what Yang stands for, to just kind of hear him out and then help him to place him in a, um, in a position where he can actually make these changes. And at, I mean, maybe he won't solve it, but at least he'll put us in the right direction. And you want to know the problem is yeah. that everybody wants to be a critic, right? Yes. It's the internet. Everybody's going to say whatever they want. That's the best format to practice free speech. Because yes. nobody's going to silence you. Yes. And what it comes down to is that people want a quick fix. People don't want the, they, they don't, it's like how they say nobody, everybody loves to have bacon. Uh, I mean, uh, eat sausages and whatnot, but nobody likes to watch sausages get made. That's true. So very true. And everybody wants the quick answer. Mm -hmm. People don't want to fact check anymore. They, they just want to hear something and go with it because it sounds good. It fits their narrative. Yes. It fits them personally. Yes. You know, so in a time where everything's so rampant like that, it's even hard to explain some of Andrew Yang's policies to some people because they don't want the long-winded explanation. Mm. Well, how's he going to pay for it? Mm. It would literally take me like a big book to write for people to understand his policies or maybe to the uh, Iowa somebody caucuses. Would, <laughs> yeah somebody would literally have to like write an essay just on one sitting on Facebook like I've done it all the time mm -hmm. I write a lot of stuff I try to narrow it down but you know but I write long bible verses explaining That's Yang's math amazing That's explaining amazing. That's the math <laughs> but some people look at it and they're like, oh, this is so long. I'm not going to pay attention because it's yeah. not a quick answer. Yeah, I think I just want to add on to something here real quick. I think a lot of people nowadays, they want the Twitter response. They don't want the long, deep nuanced response i think nuance doesn't doesn't exist uh, or i mean if it does exist very few people want it they just they just want their answer in 260 characters or less yeah and th that's the thing that's the thing with and it's not really a problem i mean it's a blessing and a curse at the same time yes because for those who do want to understand it they will take the time to read what you have to say yes they will take the time to watch a 30 minute or a one hour long of long form interview, right? Like the Joe Rogan podcast. That's a popular one. That That's podcast minutes, is. I think. Listen, that podcast is almost a year old, and yeah. it's like nine or eight months old. And I think the original full podcast was like an hour and forty five minutes. Mm, that's good. <laughs> At yeah. least for me, it is. <laughs> he touches on a lot of things in specifics, like. Yes. If there was a blueprint to his policies, he lays it out flat in an hour-long video. 
uh, and he actually excels in those hour-long videos because he he gets to talk about it in depth and all about the different ideas, possibilities, nuance, and all those things. He brings up the numbers. He brings up the numbers. He brings up the data, stuff you can actually fact-check in Google. Yeah. Okay? He brings in the, the, the resource as to where he got his idea and why he's fighting for it. Exactly. Um, the other thing that I can appreciate about him is that he doesn't give those short, generic answers. Very true. I also appreciate that, yeah. The other thing I appreciate about him is that he can go to, like, a right-wing host podcast <laughs> and he can do the left too and Problem the middle. Is that the left ain't trying to the left is not trying to show him love that's the issue unfortunately yes okay <laughs> but we trying to keep it alive you know we over here sharing other in youtube influencers that we listen to yes. i listen to those podcasts all day long like i could put my phone in my pocket and just listen to it in the loud audio or put my earplugs in if i got them you know and i yes. could just sit there all day long just watching andrew yang interviews Yes. And uh, it's gotten to the point, it's bad. (laughs) Like, it's bad, but it's good. It's gotten to the (laughs) point where, like, a lot of times when people talk about his healthcare plans, Uh even though I haven't seen that he's actually had the detailed plan, you know, officially out there, but I took the time to listen to certain videos where he touches on that, like, in specifics. And one of the videos that I refer a lot of people to is... His interview that he did with Ben Shapiro. That's a good one, actually. Yeah. Okay. And he's he Ben Shapiro is a show that a lot of people on the left don't like to listen to. Exactly. They don't. So it's like I timestamp it. I think it's 40 at the 4605 line on the timeline. Mm-hmm. I timestamp it. That's where he ta- starts to talk about his plans or his vision for healthcare, how he's mm-hmm. gonna get that public option that's going to be viable in the Mm. government. Because like he says, you have to allow the people to see for themselves that the system is not rigged. Mm. You have to allow people to see for themselves that the public option is better. It is, yeah. And not just throwing all your eggs in one basket and making it mandatory. And packaging it as the greatest thing ever. Yes. Because a lot of people are still skeptical about that. Yes. So that's going to be something that's going to be hard to pass when you're trying to get rid of the private uh, sector of the healthcare. True, true. He talks about regulating, deregulating, you know, figuring out what laws make sense and what regulations don't make sense. Yes. You know, it's like, yeah. You want to have a wealth tax. Well, you know, what happens when all the billionaires decide that they want to jump ship and renounce their citizenship? Yep. And also the economy will be hit because if they go, well, then the company. Yeah. yeah and on an economic level, I guess the companies would have a choice to also close up shop, lay off workers and leave. Yes. yes. And be, you know, and the thing about the VAT, that um, the VAT that uh, that Yang is proposing, mm-hmm. you know, a, a corporation can pack up shop and leave. Anytime. But in order for them yeah. to sell to the United States, they would still have to pay that ten percent, whether or not they're on U.S. soil. Exactly. And, and the other. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just I, I was I was I was just gonna say that um, many people are viewing the VAT as you know something that will cause so many things to go up, but what they're not realizing is that the money, how Yang plans to utilize that VAT to essentially recirculate it, so that he's not actually taking out more loans. He's just, I guess, rearranging it so that the money comes to the people. So, well, you know, the thing the thing about the vet is there's countries like Europe, just mm-hmm. I'm going to throw out Europe, their vat percentage is at about 20 percent. Right. 
that's, I mean, what he's proposing here would be only 10%. That's half. So, I mean, do, as a corporation or as a wealthy person, if you move to, um, to Europe, it's going to cost 20% more. I mean, it's going to cost 10% more. Huge. Yes. So would you rather sell to the United States at a 10% VAT or do you want to go to Europe, pay a 20% VAT and then also pay the United States a 10% VAT? Yep. It's just it's it's just complicated. 30% right there that that corp that that corporation is going to be paying if exactly. I'm correct. Yes. You know, still learning. Yeah. <laughs> but if they stay <laughs> in the United States and they pay a 10% VAT, that's all they're paying. Mm -hmm. So what do you think makes more sense as a CEO of a billion dollar corporation that is already automating jobs and laying people off anyways? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just don't you think that with less human labor, less payroll, mm -hmm. uh, they don't have to give employees mandatory vacation time or benefits, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um it would make the production probably cheaper. Yes, it would. Yeah. Because you're cutting out all of that, all of that, uh, all, all the funds that you're doing now with employing humans. Mm -hmm. If you have, like Andrew would say, wall-to-wall -wall robots and assembly line bots doing most of the production, the packaging, the scanning, the picking, all of that stuff, you're cutting out the, 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 the amount that is going to, you know, cost you as a corporation to pay each worker. And mm -hmm. that's why a lot of these corporations, as far as I see it, are already pushing towards automation. Mm. You yes. know, so yes. this corporation is going to now make these products and it's going to be cheaper on the corporation to make these pro um, products. Just mm. like with the, you know, when they talk about trucking and self-driving trucks. They're no longer going at one at some point, and maybe not like in two years, but at some point, it's going to be less hand holding throughout the way, and oh, more yeah. people get off. Oh yeah, and and like Andrew uses, I think truckers get paid per mileage, if I'm right. They get paid per mileage. These yes. corporations with less hand holding down the line, that's gonna that's probably in my head that's going to uh resort to that's gonna be a result of the mileage being reduced right as far right. as pay so now they're gonna be getting paid less as there's less hand holding being needed down the line, mm -hmm. and that's just my view of that how that would go. Mm, he also sense. touches base on the fact that when those truckers, when some of them are going cross country and they're spending sometimes 16 hours out on the, on the road, which is crazy, um, but yeah, they need to go somewhere and have, have a meal, right? Yes. Um, I guess there's no idling laws. So some truckers are probably going to resort to having a motel or something so they mm. don't have to sleep in their truck. Those motels are not going to get that business anymore. Those diners are not going to get that business anymore. Yes. Um, those truck stops where the truckers get out and get their coffee or whatever, they're going to be lacking that business too. Mm -hmm. And then some truck stops are the way they are, like, you know, big and huge and everything like that, because it's a truck stop. It's not a basic gas station. Mm -hmm. Those workers are probably going to end up out of work, too, wow. because they won't be needing a human to get out of a truck at some point eventually to get, you know, their energy drinks or get their coffee or their donuts, whatever they got to do. Mm. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So what happens with their jobs? And then it's also linked with mental health again, because. Yes. And it's yeah. a cycle. It's going to continue. It's going to get worse. Like a yeah. lot of people will say. Like the naysayers, the non-believers, they will say, oh, well, this happened throughout our history, our economic history. Yes, that's true. Mm. But people forget that there is a term, um, I think the term is, it goes Luddites. Have you ever heard of the term Luddites? Mm, maybe once or twice, but I am not sure as to what it means. Luddites, if you look it up, 
-hmm. it's basically like in my own words it's basically when people riot okay. and they're angry at the machines that took over their human labor okay. like at some point in history you know people had clothes made by hand mm -hmm. and further down and further up the line it went to sewing machines and then before that it was a much less <laughs> much more labor induced uh mechanism but you know like i said it goes from handmade stitching uh, some type of you know thing technology that they invented i forgot what it's called but then it eventually evolved into sewing machines but at least those people had the equipment to you know sew a dress together yes so their income to me wouldn't have been affected much mm -hmm. except now it's more expensive because they have to buy a sewing machine yes you know but they bought that sewing machine and it made its profit back mm -hmm. those people were not laid off of a job you know people didn't have to buy clothing because they could make it themselves so that mm -hmm. didn't cause much of a gripe you know, it didn't cause much mm. of an issue. But when technology advanced in other areas of work, like locksmiths and stuff like that, mm -hmm. people revolted. People had um, riots where mm -hmm. they would go and purposely break these machines mm -hmm. just to be like, I won because I, I shut it down. Mm. And they say, and some people that are critics will say, oh, the, the wheel is always reinvented. Yes, but we still had our hands in on inventing that wheel, correct? Correct. What happens when the wheel invents itself? That's some next stage a Terminator what style. What happens with... <laughs> <laughs> we'll get a muffin. Go ahead. Um, so, I mean, what happens when the wheel invents, reinvents itself? Because at yeah. this point, look at how cars are manufactured. Yes. Big, heavy cars, trucks, all of that. Automation. <laughs> it used to take a crew of maybe at least 10 men to, you know, 10 people to put a car together. Mm -hmm. And it used to take more time to do it. Mm-hmm. Now you have big giant robot arms and machines and it's like maybe four or five of them in a row and they're all welding pieces, putting pieces together, all of that. Mm -hmm. And if you see videos like this, you, you don't see, you barely see any humans inside of those factories. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when you have robots or, or assembly line bots putting a car together, that's eventually going to go out there and be dri dri driven by someone. Mm. You got to think about when it's going to come to a time when robots start fixing other robots. <laughs> that, that'll be insane. <laughs> think about that. Yes. There's already, and I saw videos. I don't know how far people have taken it into the research because I've researched it top to bottom. Okay. Um, I've seen factories in China where there is maybe like one or two handfuls of people inside of the factory mm -hmm. and they're only there as a fail safe. They're only there in case of a uh, bot breaks down. You have a maintenance crew that comes in to, you know, di dissect the issue and fix it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Button pushers. But you don't see one or two thousand people working. Mm. And this is the other point that I want to bring up. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've I try like my social media game. I've tried to be a little bit more like, OK, let me take a breather before I respond to this person. OK, because I got to understand that some people are ignorant to the reality of it because they don't know enough about it. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of take a breather and I'll, you know, the, my point is carrier. I mm -hmm. don't know if you've heard of carrier, but they do I like, have. yes. Yeah. They do like AC units and stuff. Right. There's a carrier plant in Indiana mm -hmm. that uh, was already working on laying off people. Mm-hmm. But they were going to literally, I guess they were going to literally shut down the, the factory 
mm-hmm. and move everything over to Mexico. I think okay. Donald Trump heard or knew what was going on, and he decides that he wants to go and negotiate. Mm. So I think this was one of his first negotiations. And yes. so he goes in, meets the, the people, people working there, got to see him, photo ops, all that, you know, him talking to the CEOs and, and stuff. And um, he said that he was going to negotiate the greatest deal and he was going to tax carrier if they even left because he wanted people to stay working and he was going to guarantee these people kept their jobs. Mm. This is a plant that had maybe at least 14 hundred people or a hundred or I mean a a thousand people you know Mm -hmm. somewhere along that number Mm -hmm. so all of these people really believe that he was going to keep their jobs he was going to stop the the company from moving and everybody's going to keep their jobs people Mm -hmm. voted for him and they believed it yes and I think they laid off somewhere close between four or five hundred people Mm-hmm. The corporation laid these people off, hundreds, like half of their workforce inside of the plant. Which is insane, yeah. And what Donald Trump ended up giving them a tax break, mm-hmm. the corporation, I think mm-hmm. worth like $7 million or something. Mm-hmm. But it was millions. And the corporation went and invested in automation, to take over part of production. Oh my gosh. And Carrier still moved part of their heating coil or something production when another se- uh, sector of their production still went and moved it to Mexico. Wow. So there, okay. was ha- there was another half of people who got laid off. Oh man. So I think there were, that resulted in two layoffs and this is right after the holidays. Right after New Year's Eve in January. I think January 12th is when the workers came out and had press conferences. I see. And people were crying. People didn't know what they were going to do. If Andrew Yang was president, those people would have at least had $1,000 to fall back on. Yes, so true. And I'm sure Andrew Yang would not have given Carrier the $7 million uh, tax break. Yes. And still allowed them to move production to Mexico. I don't think that would have happened. Yes. Especially not with a value-added tax attached to it. Because Mexico's value-added tax is 16%. You are an intelligent person. I'll give you that. <laughs> think about it, though. Yeah. Think about how relevant that is right now. It is. It is, yeah. And how important it is to vote for Andrew Yang and get him into the prime, you know, get him past the primary and have him be the one that debates Donald Trump in the general. And he's going to win it. (laughs) I am sorry, but I'm making my I'm making my argument for Andrew Yang when I say this. How ironic is it that as soon as Trump became president, first thing he does is flop his first deal. Yep. And still allow people to lose their jobs. So if I, I think we'll, we'll, we'll probably come to a close, but if, if there was one thing, Naomi, that you had to say to someone who is not sure if they want to choose Yang, what is that one thing you would tell them? To at least give him a chance. Mm-hmm. Um, I think some of the people who haven't heard of him, who are probably Trump supporters, especially the people who might have lost their their jobs due to that deal at Carriers or might have ended up in financial distress because of the trade wars. Mm -hmm. I think what they should do is look into Andrew Yang, reach out to other people in Yang Gang and ask them, hey, Yang Gang, what's going on? Tell me about your guy. Mm hmm. I think they need to maybe watch a couple of his podcasts, especially the long form ones. I Mm -hmm. mean, even if they just put their earbuds on and, you know, continue doing whatever it is they're doing, just listen to Andrew Yang. Listen to what he has to say, because he's connecting the dots that a lot of other people are not connecting. The one thing is that he doesn't alienate anybody. 
You know, when right. Hillary Clinton won, she, I mean, when she was running, she called Trump supporters deplorables, yes. a basket of deplorables. How do you, as a politician, expect those voters to look at you and say, yeah, she's got my vote? Are you crazy? <laughs> yes, yeah, so true. And he doesn't do that. He tries to understand these people. I mean, mm-hmm. hell, even if he, he's got people that on the alt right who support him. Yeah. And it's not because they support him because he's an alt right candidate. He's not on the right. He's not a Republican. Mm hmm. But he appeals to their struggle Mm -hmm. and their struggle is no different than mine's. It's not no different than anybody else's. We're all struggling. Mm -hmm. We're all hurting. Exactly. And, you know, he says a lot of times Donald Trump is not. What is it that he says? He says Donald Trump is not the the problem. He's a manifestation of the problem. Yes. Okay. uh, Donald Trump brought up a lot of things that people felt. Like his voters, they felt that everything mm-hmm. he would say, all oh, the immigrants are taking your jobs. All oh, this is happening because of this. And and they ate it up because he was speaking to their concerns. He made these people yeah. feel like he cared about their woes. You yeah. know. And yeah, he diagnosed he he diagnosed a lot of the problems. He pointed out a lot of the issues, but he misdiagnosed it. And he misled people to believe that this is why they're losing their jobs. When in reality, they're losing their jobs because of automation. automation. And Andrew, yep. yes, Donald Trump pointed out the problems, but Andrew has the solutions. And people need to at least give him a fair chance and at least listen to what he's got to say. And if you don't so like it, true. don't vote for him. Yes. If you don't like him, don't vote for him. Mm-hmm. Vote for Trump. That's fine. Mm-hmm. But at least give him a chance because he's not like the other politicians that leave a nasty taste in people's mouths. He's not that guy. So true. Okay? So true. So, so I think um, people- yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. No, I was just. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, wow, Naomi, you are such a passionate person, and and I I think for anyone listening would be able to just understand the passion and the and how personal it is for you that you know you just um, want Yang to just get in there and win it, and I think after hearing this, I think. Some people will definitely look into Yang and see why he has made such a lasting impact in your own personal life. So just want to say thank you very much for... Let me just say one more thing, yeah. though. Sure, thing. sure. There are some people who live in certain states who don't mm-hmm. have to change parties or register under a certain party. And I believe that that would be called open primary states. Like, I think, I believe Texas is one of them. And South Carolina, I think, as well. But yes. Okay. Well, South Carolina is big, too. We can get into that, like, tomorrow if you want to. But right. um, I've got something special for that. Anyway, um, if you're a Republican and you live in any of those open primary states, you can vote for Andrew Yang in the primary without mm-hmm. switching party, party affiliation. And in the general, you could keep your Republican status and in the general, vote for Donald Trump if that's what you want to do. Mm-hmm. But please get that man into office if you really think he's, 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 uh, he's a game. Yes. Vote him into the Democratic primary so he yes. can push through, debate Trump, and then we could see two uh, you know, business guy types go after each other if you're sick of politicians. And so I if think you live both, in one of those states, consider voting for Andrew Yang in a primary and get him in there against Trump. And we'll see yeah. who's the best man win. <laughs> I think both you and I have an idea as to who might win. <laughs> we'll see. Because a lot yeah. of them are still like, oh, Trump is going to get Trump 2020. Trump's going to be president. He's going to get another four ter- you know, years. And Andrew Yang is, is a joke. And that, if you think he's a joke, put them up against each other. Yes. Yes. Okay. So because either way you win. <laughs> if your guy <laughs> wins, you win. If my guy wins, trust me, you're gonna win. 
Yeah, yeah, with the thousand dollars and so many different things. Yes, absolutely. Naomi, thank you very much for being on here with me. And we will definitely have you again because I think you are a voice that needs to be heard as to what this means for you. So thank you very much, Naomi. And we'll see you on another podcast as soon as possible. All right. Whenever, let me know. All right. Awesome. Take and care. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye-bye. You too.